Hi, everyone. My name is Nicola. If we haven't met yet, um, I am the RGD president, and I am here with a couple of design leaders and studio owners from Toronto. We're going to talk about the GTA and uh, all of its design community and industry, good things and bad things. Um, so I'm going to start by asking our participants to introduce themselves, tell us who you are, where you work, and just a quick line about, about your studio. Blair, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Uh, hello, my name is Blair Francie. I am the senior designer at uh, Trajectory Brands. We're a small branding agency located in the distillery district. Um, and uh, I'm also a, an educator at uh, George Brown College in the branding degree program there. Um, that's it. Amazing. Barry, do you want to tell us a little bit about you? Sure. Uh, Barry Quinn, uh, founder of a firm called Quake in Toronto in the Roncy part of town west end of the city right by the lake and our big thing is we do brands and we sort of work with people who are in the either making quakes or dealing with quakes that's sort of our, our specifics nice brent what about you hi i'm brent long i am co-founder and director of client happiness for fusion design group we're a small creative studio in markham so about 30 minutes north of toronto and uh, we do mostly visual identity and corporate communications. Thanks. Nice. Okay, let's kick this conversation off by just talking a little bit about what it means to be a designer working in Toronto. What is the experience of, of being a designer and running a design business here that might be a little bit different than what folks in other cities and towns across the country might experience? What comes to mind? I mean, the biggest thing you're going to find that the difference between, say, most of the other rest of the country is just the concentration of clients, the concentration of budgets, um, and the fact that if you're in Toronto, you can get anywhere quickly. We have two fantastic Ooh. airports. So, mm -hmm. you know, I spend pre pandemic, I flew out of the country 70 times that year. So, more than once a week, I'll be on a plane flying somewhere. And you can do that in this city pretty well because we have really good coverage um and, you know if you think about toronto so the only cities in north america that are larger than toronto are mexico city new york city and los angeles we're bigger than every one of those other countries other other cities in you know two other countries and we probably have you know the the probably as a result the fourth largest arts um industry and then on top of that, I think it's the status, something like 51% of Toronto's residents are foreign born. So pretty much if you create design in this city, it's already ready for the world. It's already been tested on every country just by doing it here. So I think those are the things that make this one kind of unique to, to other cities. Now, every other city will have a version of that, but I think our scale and our proximity to a large market makes us kind of like different at a business level. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Brent, what about you operating like just outside of the city? Um, you know, the only difference, well, I mean, now there's no difference post pandemic, if we are post pandemic is just, you know, I used to be traveling into Toronto all the time. So as much as our office is out of my home, um, you know, I was, three, four times a week driving downtown and just, you know, piggybacking meetings, trying to coordinate. So if I was going down there, I mean, I could avoid traffic. So that was the bonus of, of not actually working downtown at the time. But, you know, I was still traveling to meetings and now it's just, it's all virtual, no matter who they could be down the street or they could be in Toronto, across the country or wherever, you know, we have a, we have a couple of international clients and other than time zones, you know, nothing, nothing changes for me. Here I am in my little box. Your little Zoom corner. Yep, my little Zoom corner. <laughs> Blair, what about sort of the design community here? Um, I, I, have you experienced design communities outside of Toronto? Have you been anywhere else? Or have you always come up in this community? Um, I, uh, I mostly was brought up in, in well, I was born and raised in Toronto. Um, so, yeah. so brought up uh, here for sure. Um, I, I did my master's in London, um, England. So I kind of had that experience a little bit, just sort of getting a sense of 
the design aesthetic over there is very different from it is here, right? And so it was, and and also because our program was very international, there was a lot of South Korean students there. It was it was a really good mix of of understanding what design in the world is a little bit. Um, so it, it's it, it was a great opportunity to kind of see other non-Canadian designers, I guess, <laughs> um, and not just graphic designers, but designers of all the stripes um, really in the program. Um, so coming back here was a, um, a, it made me sort of understand, I guess, the Canadian perspective of design a little bit better um, and maybe lean into it a little bit more, um, just sort of having that experience, I guess. Uh, Say more, what is the Canadian perspective of design? Uh, um, I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, me too, um, that's why I asked. <laughs> Um, I think, well, at, at George Brown, we just had that um, Canada Modern exhibit on, and which was really fantastic and a really great, you know, I brought some of my students out and I was like, let's talk about this stuff. Like, this is our yeah. history, really how Canadian design kicked off. Um, and so I think there's a lot of the roots of that are still percolating in our um, design aesthetic these days. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't really have like an excellent... <laughs> answer to that question um, I think it's it's still a, a little conservative and and that's not a bad thing necessarily but it's it's a little reserved much like Canadians are um, I think it sort of speaks to who we are as a people in a way um, but there is great um, great designers in this country that are really kind of pushing the envelope and um, and doing more interesting things out there than that I think a lot of people get to see necessarily. I think one of the interesting things that's come up in this conversation that hasn't come up in some of my other regional conversations so far um, is the internationalness of the city. And not to say that other cities in Canada aren't international, but it, all three of you have mentioned that already. Um, what kind of influence do you think that that has on, on the kind of work we do? I mean, Barry, you touched on it already a little bit about sort of like work that works here is going to work elsewhere more than likely yeah i mean i think the thing if you live in toronto's market so if you if you're here even if you're not yeah. a Toronto based firm is on any of the larger projects you have your competitors are international right right so yeah. so you might live in toronto and work in toronto but that does not mean you're competing against torontonians or yeah. even canadians and in fact if it's a large big project it's just as likely that you'll be competing with really big brand name agencies from another market, most likely the US. Um, so I think, you know, that starts to bleed over because as much as we're a quote unquote region, and as much as at some level there is a regional Toronto aesthetic, um, the work life here is usually not regional. Um, the work life here is usually, you know, national, or international, meaning like your work usually has to not just reflect here, but has to reflect, you know, something that would work across the country or work across North America or work across the world. So I think that that that's that's true of other cities in, 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 the, in the country. But I think that it is a daily fact if you live in a sorry, if you work in a, an office in this city that's doing work. Um, like at a, a top tier level agency, it doesn't matter who you are. Um, and I think it's probably something that the advertising business in this market also has. PR firms are probably saying the same thing. So I think that is our challenge. I mean, we, we have Canadian banks that will do rebrands in Canada and not hire Canadian firms. Yeah. You know, so that's, that's the reality. The big, the big juicy projects in this country that are in the big markets are not quote unquote Canadian. So you, so I think to make it here, we probably have a, an underdog mentality, like, oh my God, we have to be as good as, you know, it's probably like, probably in the country, people look at us like, oh my God, Toronto only thinks of themselves. And then when you live in Toronto, you actually have the complete opposite because you're, you're living in the shadow of your big brother or your big sister in the States. You're like, how are we ever going to compete against those guys? And, you know, you end up having to, that's what, that's, I think, that's not the only experience, but I think that is an experience in the city. 
And I, and I go one step further, you know, to sort of jump off from that is the, the networking connections, like we're a small firm. So, you know, the fact that we've met people who started off in Toronto and, and then went elsewhere, that's, that's how a small firm like us gets, like we have one client that's in Angola and, and Portugal. So, you know, like, how would we have those connections if we didn't start with those people when they are in the Toronto market as a client and then moved away for other opportunities and, and decided to reach out? Um, so, point. I mean, we're, we're very lucky that way that, that they did choose, that, that they did believe that we still had the, you know, the, uh, the ability, capability to do what they were looking for, even though they were in a totally different market with access to a whole bunch of different firms. Yeah, I think that's so interesting. I mean, that's been a bit of a through thread in all of the regions I've spoken to so far, you know, clients that were here in this market or in that region um, and relationships that were really strong stayed even once those clients went elsewhere, right? Moved companies, moved cities, moved countries, moved continents. Um, I think that's kind of a magical part of our business too, right? How relationship driven it can be. <laughs> Mostly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Go ahead, how's Brad. that going to change? You know, that's, you know, post pandemic, how's that going to change when we're not seeing, you know, those, all of those relationships were, were really fostered when we saw each other on a regular basis. Um, you know, so I'm always curious how strong relationship with brand new clients that I've met in the past couple of years, how can I create a bond with them? You know, when it's so easy to just be like, Red's just a face on the screen and yeah, he swears and he's funny and, you know, they do good work, but, you know, do I have a real bond with them? Like the people that I've met in person that I've, you know, presented and entertained in presentations and taken them to lunch and, you know, all those things. I don't know. Uh, time will tell. Brent, get on a plane. A plane? The, How do you, you know, get this, to a plane? You know, Nicola, you mentioned it, but like the core of good design is trust because we invent something from nothing. And the only reason you have anybody, you know, will, will let you do that is that they trust you. And because we, you know, we, we sometimes get stuck on, oh, I like this typeface, oh, I like that color, whatever. But, you know, so at, at the larger end of things, if you design something and it goes poorly, you know, the very famous, uh, I won't name the client, but there's a very famous, um, beverage company that had a very famous designer design the, the packaging. I read somewhere that they lost 50% of their sales overnight and they only clawed back half of those over time. Now, that actually means that there's somebody on a shift somewhere that doesn't get the extra shift. That could mean a kid somewhere doesn't get the new winter jacket, right? Yeah. It, like they're like, it could, it, it could be depending upon what you're doing, very major if, if your design work doesn't go somewhere. So I think, you know, what you're mentioning, Nicola, about all these relationships, ultimately it's a business based on trust. And, you know, we, you have to work hard at making that trust, you know? Yeah. I sorry, think I'm sorry so. to me to be a downer, guys. No, I think that's true. And I, I, I'm sort of jumping off that a little bit there. The other thing that I find about Toronto too is that as big as of a city as we are, we are actually quite small. And so those connections and those networks, like, uh, you know, I, I was freelancing for 10 years. And when I joined Trajectory, I was able to bring some of my clients on board with us and have continued those relationships and strengthened them even more because now I have a team that we can kind of fall back on as needed. Right. But a lot of those clients, I would say 98% of the clients I had over the 10 years is all through relationship building. It, I rarely had to put in a proposal for anything because it was just sort of like, oh, you need a designer, you should talk to Blair or, you know, that kind of thing. So there's a, <clears throat> you, and, and as Brent, I think you were saying there, you know, that idea or Brent, sorry, uh, <laughs> you were saying like people move positions, uh, you know, in organizations and companies and whatnot. And so you kind of start building out that network uh in locally not necessarily internationally but sometimes they do go um international as well so yeah can we talk a little bit about how the community the sort of design community here has maybe changed a little bit um over the last decade let's say um 
I know sort of me, um, some of the things that I've noticed is a previous generation of, of studio owners held things a lot closer to the chest than the newer generation of studio owners. Um, there's definitely a, a shift in the sort of culture of transparency, transparency and, and sharing business knowledge um, in a way that I didn't observe even five years ago. Um, but I'm curious if that's something that resonates with you or if you've seen something else shift in the sort of community culture of the design industry here. I, I would agree with that 100%. I mean, I, I used to be, you know, I'm probably part of that older generation where everybody was a competitor you know, 15 years ago. Fusion's been around 28 years. And so the sort of first 10, 15 years, even friends that were designers, you know, everything, you know, we were trying to build up the business. And so, you know, we you just wanted to hold everything. And then I'll be honest that the RGD did help me with that because I met so many great people through that design community that, you know, I've I've called upon for help or asked, you know, questions and had some good mentors and like perfect example, there's a guy I worked with years ago that is a good friend of mine uh, when we both work for somebody else and we're actually going away uh, next week for a week and we're going to do like, you know, Part of it will be sort of a strategy, shoot the shit about, you know, what are you doing with your business? Well, what are you doing with your business? And, you know, where do you see it going? And how can we help each other? I mean, you know, I probably wouldn't have done that 15 years ago, um, you know, just to to think that I would be that transparent and share that kind of information. But that's that's what I'm looking forward to. I would say the biggest shift, probably, I mean, the timeline, maybe it's a little longer than 10 years. And unfortunately, I'm probably one of the causes of it. I definitely participated in happening. Is the shift away from uh, the shift away from design firms to design being incorporated into agencies? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, very early in my career, you know, I came out of work school. I was like back in those days. I got a job in my first two weeks, and I've really not been out of an office for longer than two weeks since then. So, you know, th that's a shift, I think, that was just much more. But a big, sh you know, I started opening up design firms within agencies, and then opened up an agency that also did design. And if you look at the, at the Toronto market, um, a lot of the work, the, the, the bigger work is, a lot of it is gobbled up by agencies that kind of throw in design as an extra. Um, you know, there were, you know, Jane Hope was a pioneer in that. Uh, not in doing it badly, in doing it great, but she was a pioneer in, you know, incorporating those, you know, her and Paul did a great job of doing that. Uh, my generation probably came right on the heels of that, and we did it, I did it at many, many agencies. And if we look at now, I think it's kind of changed the culture of design in this city, because at least half of what I would, you know, the award-winning design in the city, it's all done by the agencies, it's not done by design firms. Um, but and I, I, that's not something that existed 20 years ago. Uh, there was a time when the Toronto market was much more of a design cottage industry. You know, most firms would be sub 20 to 30 people. Many, many oh. firms would be sub 10 people. Um, and it was really around craft. And, uh, you know, I worked at Spencer Francy Peters when, you know, that whole thing was happening and about craft turning into brand. And then, you know, brand cleaved off. And I remember when I first opened up a design practice within an agency, my design friends looking at me like I had decided that I would sleep with the pigs tonight. You know, like they're just like, what are you doing? And within three years, you know, the, the agency world had bought up like Tut Hope and Ove and all of those big firms all got purchased and, and folded in. I mean, even Turner Duckworth in UK is now part of that whole. So that whole amalgamation started to happen. Um, and I think for a long time that was really good. And then of course now I'm a, kind of sad for the days of walking down Queen Street and it being rough and ready and everything being possible and not everything being figured out. So I think that's a, I don't know if that same culture happens in every other city. You know, I think some of the other provinces and other cities have, have maintained uh, more of the older kind of design centric uh, offices. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I'm, I'll have to. I'll have to watch all the interviews to find out. Exactly. 
<laughs> Blair, what about you? What have you what have you noticed change in the course of your career? Um, well, it's interesting. I mean, having really been on my own for 10 years <laughs> um, and then joining a firm, it was um, I kind of did things my own way for a long time and then having to kind of figure out, oh, this is what an agency is like. Um, <laughs> OK, great. Um, but then also trying to sort of introduce new ideas and like using Slack was not something that we did until like just before the pandemic. And I was like, let's try this thing. And then the pandemic hit and we're like, okay, we're using this all the time now. All in. Yeah. And we're doing it. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I think there's a, kind of what you were saying that there's a bit more of an openness to even with internally just sort of like throwing stuff out and saying like, I, I don't know, what do you think about this? Like, does this work? Does this not work? As opposed to like, holding it all back until we have to present internally to to say like and and now here's all the work I've done right um it's a little messier um I'm finding um I mean we started using Miro and I was like just use a space to throw stuff up so we can respond to it quickly and kind of get a sense of like is this going in the right direction this is a neat little piece here that kind of thing right so it's um I I think not only you know holding all the cards um to when we're just presenting to a client, but even internally, it's becoming a bit more of a, you know, just trying stuff out. We go along. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what about looking to the future? So the sorts of um, tools or skills or, or things that your firms are investing in, whether that's just time and energy or money um, right now, like what, what are you putting an effort into? One thing that we're kind of dipping our toes into is AR a little bit, yeah. and it's uh, it, it's an interesting. Um, I mean, I, I have very little experience in it, and and we're sort of bringing someone on to kind of help us onboard our own selves to understand what that means. Um, but also with this one project that we're kind of um, working on with it, really trying to understand like what is the purpose of this technology. Um, and even asking some of my students, like, do you like AR? Like, do, what do you use it for? And if there was an experience out there that had AR available, would you use it, right? And they were very kind of like, meh, you know, it, it yes, but only if it's got a purpose to it. Um, and I find a lot of the stuff that's out there right now is so just kind of like, this is cool, try it, you know, as opposed to, oh, great, but why why would I do it again? And And what is the story behind it and what, why, what is the purpose of this thing right and so I think that is one of the, the the technologies at least that we're trying to figure out from a, a branding perspective and a real a storytelling perspective is like how do you use that in the world that we live in within branding yeah I mean that's fascinating we've seen AR applied editorially really successfully but then it just sort of went away um, it's one of those technologies that seems to sort of pop up every once in a while, peter out, come back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Two our codes. They're back, but. They're back. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> Who knew that as designers, we'd come around <laughs> to the idea of a QR code? <laughs> I spent so much time telling people why the fuck did they want a QR code? And then COVID happened. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah, I did the same thing. <laughs> I think for us, we're, we're still searching more mindset over skill set. Because, uh, I mean, I, I think there's, there's, it's not if, it is when will most of the jobs that we do be automated. And it happens really slowly. It happens in programs where when you put a box up, it shows you two arrows, lets you know that that's exactly between the other two, you know, like it slowly automates things a little bit at a time. Um, and, and, and it, and there's, there's, there's literally nothing you can do to stop that from happening. Um, it will happen. AI will start to take over a lot of what we do. Um, there will be portions of this uh, of the of the work that we do that, we're, that won't require actual copywriters and won't require actual people and we know it's going to be copyright theft and all that stuff but you know what it will happen um, so what we push for is still you know in a world of wash in images in a world of wash of information 
the stuff that stands out is the extraordinary. Um, a lot of the tools will really up the quality of average, but extraordinary is still really hard <laughs> and it's still very, very rare. So, you know, our agency is really built around extraordinary. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to try to design by the pound and get into all of that because um, I, I've, I've been around long enough to remember when desktop publishing happening and when that happened, my very first zine I ever did was literally printing things out and waxing it down and putting it down. And I remember saying at the time, pretty soon we're not going to have to do this. The computer will just print out the whole thing onto film, won't it? They're like, that'll never happen. It's like, of course it will happen. You can you know, so I think the sooner that we embrace the inevitable and then figure out that our point of view, your lived experience, your ability to find out what is unique about other people, your ability to take this and this and then add you to it is, I think, the only skill that will survive technology. And it, I mean, I have a young son who's 13 and um, for Christmas, he got a record player and about five Beatles records and Fun. Black Sabbath and Nirvana. And, you know, and he listened to a lot of the stuff I listened to as a kid, but, you know, the cream is still rising to the crop. It's still, it's still relevant because it's good. And I think that if, for younger people who are watching this, I would invest in that. I would invest in figuring out the big picture and I would try to, me personally, avoid building a career on a narrow, um, technological advantage, unless you are some Madonna David Bowie like person who will then discover the next one of those and the one after, because the speed at which technological skill gets commodified is just collapsing. And what's still not, you know, we haven't figured out how to, you know, use technology to make somebody interesting and magnetic <laughs> and have something to say. That's still, that's still magic. That's still, I think that's still the magic that we have. Yeah. And you know, you're the best technology you will ever use. Like no AI, I don't care how much, it's never lived your life. It's never lived your experience. It knows all about cold. It's never been cold. It's never been in love. It's never been the shortest kid in class, the tallest, the fattest, the, the, the most loved, the least loved. It's never been any of the things you've been. And th I think th that is the superpower. I just wish I knew, you know, how to rent it for, you know, $100 a month or something. But. Fred, what about you? What's music investing in right now? Um, I think just we've we were very lucky over the last three years to to sort of remain status quo. Most of our clients were corporate, so other than this sort of two or three months blip after everybody went home for March break and then never went back, um, you know, our clients took a while to adapt to that. But once they did, you know, things kind of got back to normal. We were very lucky, but now we're back in sort of the growth stage that we were before. So to be honest, we're sort of focused on, like we just launched uh, a new website, which we've been working on for way too friggin' long, um, which was mostly me. And, and so I, I freely admit that I finally stepped out of the way of the team and just let them play. And, uh, and I only kind of went in and said, yes, that looks great because at some point you have to recognize it does have to get done. And I was impeding that, that process. Um, so yeah, we're just, we're just trying to build we're just trying to build again, to be honest. So from a technology perspective, um, you know, we're, we're not really looking at anything other than what can help make, you know, the work that we're doing for clients better, easier, faster, you know, more creative, more strategic, et cetera, et cetera. So there's nothing really specific. I will make a note because um, I know uh, Blair mentioned it and I know Nicola, we have a history with you understanding how much I fucking push back against slack but our team does use slack now and that is one of the huge ironies of life if you've known me over the last five years okay follow-up question do you use slack though i do i do uh and because i'm old and, and they're just one of the reasons I didn't want to get pushed into using yet another communication tool was because i already felt like we had so many and 
although Slack is very good and it's, you know, it's much easier for people that want that maybe are better at jumping and typing a quick note and going back to work and chat. Like I already have enough distractions in my day. I think it's hilarious to start new channels. So we have a hashtag crying channel. You know, there's, there's fun ones that I add every once in a while, but I, I always have to send an email first and say, where should I post this? <laughs> because they have so many channels that I'm like, if I put it into the wrong one, then they're like, oh, well, why did you put it into the general? That should have been this or that. And then we would have seen it sooner. And I'm like, I don't know. I said, I just, just read the emails. Focus on the relationships, friend. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are out of time. Oh, um, no. I know, right? But thank you. Thank you, all three of you, for, for sharing some knowledge, some wisdom, some experience with us. Um, and we'll talk soon. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye.